Well, I haven't moved very far because I'm still on the same stand that uh, you left me at with Atul and his very shiny shoes, I have to say. And this is Martin. Very good morning to you, Martin. Good morning. Nice to be here in the UK. Oh, and where are you from, Martin? I'm from Sweden, actually. <laughs> There, do you know there's a huge number of people from Sweden here today? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's midsummer <laughs> week, so most weeks start going on vacation right now. Well, uh, actually, everyone thinks I'm Swedish or Scandinavian because of my colouring. I'm not. I'm very British. But Martin, you are a very important man, aren't you? You've just been nominated or been nominated with a very important title. Tell us what it is. Well, I've uh, been nominated to be the most influential person in the security industry, and that's of course a very great uh, honour. It is indeed. How did you get such a high accolade? Well, I uh, do hold speeches at a lot of uh, events, events around the world. Uh, and uh, my history was obviously the fact that I, uh, me, I together with uh, another guy, we invented the world's first IP camera. And now we see the whole industry is IP. That's amazing. Does that give you a little tingle of delight when you see that the whole industry has basically been revolutionized by something you did? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's it's fantastic to see. And I think the most important thing is that we make the society more secure, which is something we all obviously want to have, given, I mean, a lot of the latest incidents. Do you think there's a, a very tricky balance here, though, between too much surveillance and personal freedom? And, you know, in Scandinavia, that's something they take very seriously. Yeah, especially in Scandinavia. But you know what? The debate has made a 180 degree turn. And uh, if we look by history, we all remember Orwell and the 1984 book and the video surveillance uh, camera being the symbol of big robberies watching you. Now, times are changing because I don't think a video surveillance camera is a lot of threat to your privacy because the number one source of uh, privacy theft, I think actually is the cell phone. So that. you have the cell phone operators, you have uh, Google, you have Facebook, who know everything about you. And uh, you can easily upload a video or a picture and it's available to anyone. That is the real security threat. Not to mention like the credit card companies, they know everything about you. So video surveillance cameras and given the huge amount of cameras we have, of course, there is no so, so is there something you can do as an individual, given that you're telling me that your, your phone is your biggest threat as an individual to your personal freedom, what, is there anything you can do, any measure you could take yourself? Or are you, are you basically beheld by those big companies? You can switch it off, and that's really <laughs> the only thing you can do. And you can stop being, paying by credit cards. But, I mean, practically, that would be very difficult, wouldn't it? It would be impossible. But those are the, if you really believe in the, the integrity and that the cameras is a big threat to you, that's where you need to begin. Well, it's a bit like, you know, those great Internet entrepreneurs who never, ever use computers connected to the Internet to make sure that their, their uh, data was protected. Um, is, there, is, there a, um, is there a sort of uh, reason or methodology? Would you suggest that people should maybe have two phones, a work phone and a private phone? That way, at least you've separated your life. Because surely you can be compromised very easily by someone finding your cell phone or one of those big companies actually using your data. No, I mean, uh, what you need to do is you have to uh, think a lot about the cybersecurity because uh, the modern terrorist, I mean, he's working behind a keyboard. And uh, you really, really need to make sure that all the products you have are up to date, they meet the secure security standards, because otherwise they will be compromised. I mean, uh, I, my training, I'm a medical doctor, and the, I, I don't know if you know, but we were hit by a major Trojan uh, invasion of the NHS computer systems. And it was a young man who foiled it in the end, who was in his early 20s. Are we going to be more reliant, do you think, on young, intelligent, entrepreneurs such as him to outsmart the baddies? Yeah, I haven't thought of that, but uh, I mean, we have a big institution to do all the research, but who basically can't disclose it. Uh, so uh, I, I, I really think that we, we need to put that into the DNA of the companies to make sure that cybersecurity is really taken seriously. So what would the message be then to people at this exhibition this year? What's the one message from you, given that you are being told that you're, being, you're such an influential person? If I'm running a big company, what's the one take-home message? Well, uh, I think it is really cybersecurity nowadays. And, uh, uh, taking a good policy on cybersecurity obviously means that you need to know the products that you put on your network. And uh, 
A lot of companies, they do OEMs, you know that. So, so the, the logo you have on the product does not necessarily mean that it's made by that company. And what happens if they get a security issue, a cyber threat? Well, they don't know who is the original manufacturer. You can't enforce a policy. So I think the number one advice is to go with someone where you actually know what you get such as many corporates standardize on like Cisco routers or HP routers, because then they know that that is what they get. Yeah. And that goes for cameras as well. I mean, certainly in terms of, I used to have a business of 50 people. We believed that we didn't want our data in the cloud because we wanted to control it. We only used one system, which was HP in those days, and then we moved to Cisco. But now, of course, no one wants the hardware. They want it, a cloud-based system. And with that comes security problems, doesn't it? Always. And that's why you need to make, make, have control of it. And, so, and probably some of your m number one operational costs is to deal with those issues. So acquisition price is one, but the cost of running it, maintaining it, that's something else. And in the Western world, those costs are typically higher than the purchase price. So in a show like this, who is your ideal person to talk to? Is it the procurement people or is it the chief executives? Is it the people who are looking at the balance sheets? Who do you have to persuade or is it your IT consultant? Well, it could be any of those actually. I mean, it's depending on how companies are organized and how seriously we take on those threats. Typically, all larger corporations do have persons, do have policies that they follow. So. Uh, then, I mean, who is the main man to make the decision? I think that varies a lot. And perhaps you could give me an insight into who, which sort of companies are most at risk. Is it the SMEs who are struggling? You know, they're the backbone of uh, certainly the, the British economy. Or is it the multinationals? Which is a bigger target and which need to protect themselves more and which can do it the best? Well, I think it's in general the SMEs because the smaller company you are, you less aware you are of the cybersecurity issues. So uh, educating those companies is very difficult. It is indeed, and also it's very expensive. It's very expensive, and when they look on the cost of setting it up, I mean, they only look on the acquisition price. They don't factor in all the maintenance that they need to have and the risk if they being, be compromised. Well, Martin, there is no doubt at all in my mind that you are the number one person to talk to about this. They were definitely right in your title. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. A great pleasure to be here at DIPSEC.